tonight, and uh, and I think it's I think it's going to be important. And all I'm going to do is um, this should shut off. Nope, wrong one. That should shut that off, and you can see that a little bit better. That's not too dark for any of you, is it? No. And uh, and so. What I want to talk to you about, particularly in the light of what is happening in the news, and, uh, and again, I want to say, even as I ask the question, do you know what time it is? Does anybody really know what time it is? And the answer to that is, yes, we do. And the scriptures are clear about those things, that we are in the last days, and they are Laodicean days, where the churches really, you know, have lost their power and so forth. And it's interesting, I, I saw somebody else on, online, I, I, I recognized him and I just tried to listen in. They had videotaped it or whatever. And, uh, and he was talking about the churches uh, in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. I thought, which was interesting, you know, that we're miles apart. Uh, I know this person, I'm not necessarily, quote, friends with them, but I know of them. And, uh, and that they were covering a little bit of the same ground that, uh, that, that we were looking at. And so, but I want you to know that, that they are languishing times, and these also are prophetical times. You know, where things are being fulfilled right before us, and uh, sometimes we're not aware of them, but we should be a little bit aware, because the Lord will say, don't let this day catch you unaware. And so... We need to be mindful of the times that we are in. And specifically, we are in the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles. So I want you to go with me. I want you to go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And uh, let's start there. The times of the Gentiles. And we're going to see what that means. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some other things tonight. Now, if I don't get to finish this, Lord willing, we'll finish it next Sunday night. And uh, because there's a few things to look at, some of them are pretty detailed, and I don't expect you to get every detail, but we can get a general idea in, in what we're looking at. So let's go to Luke 21, and look with me please in verse 5. That's where I want to begin reading, Luke 21, verse 5. The Lord Jesus here has gathered, and uh, this is nearing the time. Uh, he's at the Last Supper, if you will. He's about to go out to the Mount of Olives. And, uh, and uh, because, because of this time, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and so forth. And Judas is going to betray him in the next chapter. So, well, so we're in that upper room, if you will, where he told the disciples to gather and prepare for us the Lord's Supper. And he's going to tell them some things. He's going, to, he's going to explain some things to them that we want to look at tonight. Look in verse 5. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which you behold, the days will come. Future. The days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that should not be thrown down. Do you know there was a lot of gold in that temple and things? you know what they did? When the Romans got there, we're going to learn about that. When the Romans got there, they actually separated one stone from the other because the melted gold had gone in between the cracks and they don't want any of that to be gone. And so, uh, and so there's, they're going to be thrown down. Verse 7, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them. There are going to be deceivers in the world. The book of, of 2 Timothy said that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving other people and being deceived. And so, we're, you know, th we haven't seen this come to pass yet where somebody said, well, I'm the Christ. And, you know, now we've had the David Koresh's. He said he was Christ. And there have been some others out there that have claimed that title, like Jim Jones and, and so forth, some of them. But, but uh, I think it's something even a little more specific that we have not seen yet. All right. And so look at verse 9. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, look at that next line, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Meaning it's not just around the corner. 
There's some things, all right? And it's, in other words, it's not, it's not going to be a long ways off, but, but anyway, but let's have a word of prayer and then, and then we'll begin, all right? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the words of our blessed Savior, wholesome words, dear God, and we just thank you, Lord, for the peace that he speaks to every heart. And Lord, thank you for preserving our Bibles for us, that we can have an insight, Lord, into that conversation and some things that we can take away from this tonight. And I pray the Holy Spirit might illuminate our hearts, Heavenly Father, and give us understanding, Lord, uh, not that we become Bible scholars, but Lord, that the peace of God may rule in the hearts of your children. I love them tonight. And Lord, I thank you for them. I pray you'll touch them. Bless Brother Mel tonight, Lord. And I pray against that fever, dear God, and that you'll heal his body. And uh, Lord, we just ask that your will be done now, Lord, in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right? Now go down to verse 24. Verse to same chapter, Luke 21, verse 24. And it says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until, now here's the catchphrase, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now think about it with me. You know, prior to these days, prior to the period between the Testaments, some 400 years, that uh, Israel really was the dominant force that was in the world. And, uh, and they were, <coughs> pardon me, they were the dominant force that was in the world. And when you read your Old Testament and you read about uh, people like the Assyrians and you read about the Chaldeans and you read about the Samaritans and you, and you read about the Hittites and the Egyptians, only those nations who rubbed elbows, so to speak, with Israel are mentioned in the Bible. The others really did not matter, and that's the reason why God didn't write about them. We don't know many things about the land of Nod, where Cain went, right? He just went off there, and you got Tubal Cain and Jubal Cain. You got some of his kinfolk and all, and the story ends. Why? Because God's not really has not really been interested in those that were not going to follow him, those that were not interested in those things. And so they're not written about. But the nation of Israel, man, when they came through, crossed the Red Sea, boy, they went through the Edomites, they went through the Ammonites, those are, those are, and the Moabites, those are the descendants, of Moab and Ammon, Edom is the descendant of Ishmael, a correction of, uh, I'll get it right here in a second, of um, Jacob's brother, I'm having a meltdown here, Esau, Esau all right? And, and uh, Moab and Abin are the, are the incestuous offspring of, of uh, Lot and his daughters. And they went through there, and then these kings are going to come against them. Others that we read about, even in Abraham's day, like Chedorlaomer and some others that came against the nation of Israel, and yet they remained, they remained in power and defeated them because the hand of God was with them. He said, I will go there and I will drive them out from before you. And that's exactly what the Lord did. And so, but now a change has come. And look what's happening. A change is taking place. And he says here that not one stone is going to be left on top of another. And Jerusalem is going to be trodden underfoot by a bunch of Gentiles. And for how long? Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And so we're going to look at that phrase, and that's what we want to talk about tonight. Let's get the context of this. The context. Here the Lord is about to, going to be, pardon me, betrayed. He's going to be taken into custody. We know that He's going to be beaten, flogged, and all those things are going to happen to Him. He's going to be nailed to the cross, buried. He's going to rise again in three days. We know that some 50 days after that, Pentecost is going to come in. But at the time of when the Lord Jesus walked, there were powers that were already coming into be, already were there. The, the, the land of, of uh, and it's not, and, and let me just throw this out here to you, it's not the land of Palestine. You don't read that in the Bible. It's, it's the land of Judah. It's the land of Israel. Palestine is a Latin word that came from one of the Roman Caesars or whatever and gave it Palestinia, gave it that name and, re, and removed the name of Judah. So that's not something. So when you hear the news and you hear these things, well, we were here before the Jews. No, you weren't. 
And if you were here, you were moved out of the land because of your wickedness, according to the book of Leviticus. That's why he cast them out and he warned the nation of Israel, don't do like the people that I'm removing because if you do, the land is going to spew you out just like it spewed those folks out because of their gross immorality. And, uh, and so, so the context here is the Lord is telling them this is what's going to happen. It's going to come to fruition and it does happen in 70 A.D. is when it occurs. In a, and so what is prophecy? Prophecy is history that is written in advance. Prophecy is going to be history that has been written in advance. And so here the Lord Jesus begins to detail the coming days of what's going to happen to Herod's temple. You see, the other one that was built was Solomon's temple. And Nebuchadnezzar, them, they destroyed that. They took all the, they took all the, um, all the instruments, all the, all the cups and everything. Do you remember when, have you ever heard the saying, boy, well, the handwriting's on the wall. You ever heard that before? Do you know where that comes from? That comes from the Bible, the book of Daniel. It's like we were talking about this morning. A little bird told me. Or, uh, you know, that's the fly in the ointment. All that stuff comes from the Word of God. That's where it came from. And so the handwriting on the wall happened to, to Belshazzar and, uh, because they desecrated some things. And so the, the uh, Chaldeans were going to come. And they do come and they remove all those things. And they are sent into exile in about 587 B, uh, B.C. All right, before Christ, 587 B.C. The other one went into captivity through the Assyrians in 720 B.C. You know that time runs backwards, right, as you're coming down to zero. 720 B.C. and then 587 is when, is when the other ones did it. Are you all getting too cold? All right. So, so but what's going to happen here, Herod's temple has been built. When they came back in the land and so forth, they're under, under Ezra and Nehemiah, they laid the foundation again and so forth. Some things were, were repaired, but now you've got Herod's temple, and Herod's temple is going to be overrun because, overrun because Jerusalem is going to be sacked. That's kind of a British term, which means that they overthrew it. I mean, they, they, they destroyed it. They destroyed it. And so Titus, the Roman emperor, is the one that did that. And uh, Titus of Rome in 70 A.D., so this is 70 years, oh, actually about 47 years, 37 years after the Lord Jesus was crucified. He died around the age of 33, so 33 and, uh, four, uh, and uh, 37. So 37 years later, Herod is going to come along and, uh, correction, Titus is going to come along and destroy Herod's temple. Now Masada, how many of you all have heard of Masada? What, do you know what's so unique about Masada? No, it's up on a hill. It's up. It's up on a mountain. It's a mount. It's a mountainous, a mountaintop fortress. And and I have heard this. I haven't verified it, and I should have done that. But I've heard this that whenever they, whenever uh, through after basic training, whenever the soldiers, the the Israeli soldiers, they take them to Masada, and they bring them up there, and they want to, they want them to see that place where nine hundred of those zealots took their own lives rather than go into captivity at the hands of the Romans. And for I don't know how many days and weeks they held them off because to get to Masada there was a pass and they blocked that and they kept Titus from being able to get in there and they laid siege to it. And so, but Masada is where they take these graduates of basic training to sort of put in them that spirit of Zionism that, man, we're going to defend our land. And you see how they have responded. People are already, people, Jewish people that are in other countries are already going back home so they can put a uniform on. You know, one of the guys that got away kissed his wife goodbye and said, I'm going back in the army, and that's what he did. And women also. And, uh, and they're doing these things. And so, so that, that idea of nationalism and, and supporting their country and supporting one another, it's a, str it's a strong bond that they have. And so, so here is the context. And so the Lord Jesus' words were both historical as well as prophetical. Now let's clarify something. The church is not involved in this because the church has been hidden in the mind of God according to Ephesians chapter 3. So let's go there. Turn right in your Bible. Go to the book of Ephesians with me, please. 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and then Ephesians. And then look in chapter 3 with me. 
Ephesians chapter 3. And this is part of the reason why Paul got in such trouble was because he was introducing something that was new. And what was new, it was, it was the introduction to that Jews and Gentiles could be in the same body together. And that man just pitched a fit because we're unclean according to them. That's what, that's what Gentiles are. That's what it means, unclean. And if you're not Jewish, then you're a Gentile. I don't care if you're from Mexico or if you're from, if you're from the Philippines or you're from Bacharach, Syrobia. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. Okay? All right? Now, I, I have some Jewish DNA in me, about 8 or 9%, but I, I like ham. Amen? All right. And so, uh, but, but look with me in Ephesians chapter 3. Notice what it says. Paul said for this, verse 1, Paul said for this cause, I, the prison, I, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. And what was that? It was the fact that those who were far off, that's us, could be made nigh by the blood of Christ. And that Jesus has taken both those that were far off and those that were near joined them together, and now instead of being twain, they are one. One in the body of Christ. And right now, that is how God looks at all people. He doesn't see Jew and Gentile anymore. He just sees the human race and says that it needs a Savior. And that's why the Bible says that God was not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, both Jew and Gentile alike. That's how he sees them right now. So the church is hidden in the mind of God. Look in chapter 3 there. Let's keep reading just, just for a little bit. Notice what he says in verse 4. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now watch that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. That was something new. The idea of a Redeemer, the idea of a Messiah, that is not new. That's what we read in the book of Romans, which he said, you know, uh, that, that, that was prophesied or by the prophets. They knew there was going to be a Messiah that was coming. They just didn't know that Messiah was going to bring both Jew and Gentile together. And that's what got Paul in trouble. That's why he was arrested in part for preaching that, all right? So the church was something that was hidden in the mind of God. So let's clarify something, these two phrases. One is the times of the Gentiles, and the other is the fullness of the Gentiles. Those are two different things. You're in Ephesians. Go back left and look in Romans with me. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. The, the times of the Gentiles are different from the fullness of the Gentiles. Look in verse 25. Romans 11 verse 25. We got time for you to turn there, okay? Notice what it says. He said, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Now watch, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What is the fullness of the Gentiles? Well, I'm glad you asked, all right? The fullness of the Gentiles refers to those Gentiles who God is going to save and make, help to make up part of the body of Christ. When that body is complete... That will be the, the fullness of the Gentiles. When those that are going to get saved in this dispensation are going to be come in and be made a part of the body of Christ. They are going to be a part of the bride of Christ. And they're going to be Jews in there also. They're called Messianic Jews. Have you ever heard that term before? Jews who have been born again and who realize that Jesus Christ is Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua means Jehovah Savior. Yeshua HaMashiach, that is Jesus Christ the Messiah. And they recognize that. And man, they know He is their Lord and Savior. And they have trusted Him. And so the fullness of the Gentiles refers to the making up of that body that He is putting together. 
When a person gets saved by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit baptizes you, immerses you into the body of Christ. You become a part of the body of Christ the moment that you get saved. And so too for Jews to, in this day, those Messianic Jews, when they get born again, they are immersed by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. It happens instantaneously and, uh, and they become a part of that body. The times of the Gentiles in Luke that we read about, the times of the Gentiles represent something different. It refers to those Gentile world powers who will rule till the Lord Jesus returns. So the times of the Gentiles when they're in power, the fullness of the Gentiles, all those that are going to get saved and make up the body of Christ. That is the difference. So when you're reading that, don't confuse those two things because they're not the same, all right? And so the fullness of the Gentiles, that began at Pentecost. Y'all with me? That's when the church was birthed, Pentecost. It's when it was organized, an organism, all right? The Holy Spirit came, 3,000 people were added on the, after that first message. Wow, I wonder where they went to church, brother. You know, I mean, well, you know, uh, you know, I mean it's great we, got, we have a building and we got places and all, but we couldn't handle 3,000 here all at once. Man, all y'all would have to be Sunday school teachers, all right? And uh, well, what, what kind of, we'd have to have this for the nursery, I suppose. Uh, you know, the whole thing for nursery, 3,000 people coming in, all right? And so, and so the fullness of the Gentiles, it begins at Pentecost, and it's going to end at least seven years before the times of the Gentiles ends. And we're going to talk about that. At least seven years before the end, all right? Y'all with me? You, you're nodding your head. You're with me. All right, good. So now let's, let's talk about this. A picture's worth a thousand words, all right? Let's look at this. Look at that up there. Peaks of prophecy. Now here, this is an Old Testament. This is an Old Testament prophet, and what did he see? In other words, the idea of a redeemer is not something new. What Paul introduced in the book of Romans about, about, about someone who was going to be delivered for our offenses is not new. I mean, notice what this says. Notice what does that say right there? Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. Isaiah is a Jew's favorite prophet. And there it talks about the servant of the Lord, if you will, that he's going, he's going to bear all these things. He was bruised for our, our offenses. He was, you know, he was uh, buffeted and so forth. He bore our sins. And uh, there was no beauty in him that we should desire him. All those things are going to happen to him. You know, all we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's what happened. And that was not anything new. What Paul was preaching and teaching wasn't some new doctrine, a strange doctrine. They knew all that. And so, but those prophets, as they looked, they could see that there was going to be a Redeemer. Someone was going to pay the price. They also could see ahead to the Antichrist. When we get to the book of Daniel... That's what they can see. Daniel's going to write about that. He knows that. Gabriel brings him all those things and God reveals to him some things. But notice this down here. Remember I said the church was hidden? It's down in the valley between these two things and those prophets of old couldn't see it. Daniel didn't know anything about the church. Moses didn't know anything about the church. Samuel, the first prophet, didn't know anything about the church. None of them did because it was hidden in the mind of God. And it was Paul, the apostle Paul, who was going to bring that revelation to light. You know, do you know what the word church, you know what the word for church is? When, when you go past a, when you go past a, a, a Spanish church, uh, it might say... Uh, Iglesia Baptista Libertad. So what is that? What, what in English? Well, Iglesia. What is that? That's a church. Okay? That's where you get the word Ecclesia. That's a called out assembly. That's what a church is. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. There was no church in the Old Testament. They just moved two million plus people through the wilderness. But it wasn't a church. The believers in there hadn't been baptized into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament could come and go. He would come on Samson for service. He would give him strength. And after that, he would, he'd be gone. Remember, he wist not that the Spirit was taken from him. The Spirit was gone. He didn't know it. 
did not know it. So, so here what we have in these peaks of prophecy, we've got these Old Testament, this is what they saw. They saw that there was going to be a, a Redeemer. They knew, according to Isaiah, didn't he say, unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given? His name shall be Counselor, Wonderful, Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Ancient... I mean, they had all the names, they had all the titles. They just didn't believe it was Jesus. They didn't recognize His birth. They didn't recognize... You know, and I think which is a funny thing, they didn't even recognize that He was probably the only guy running around there that was about 33 years old. Because all the other ones had been killed, remember? What did they do? They went through and killed all the boys, two years old and younger. He would have kind of stood out in his generation. It's almost like, you know, it's almost be like in the 60s and somebody said, no, I, did, I didn't go. Or, or like World War II. Uh, well, did you get, how did you go? Well, I, I wasn't drafted. You, you weren't drafted. How, how, how did you get to be here? How did you, have, you know, that kind of thing. And so uh, he, he would have stood out in that. And so the prophets did not see that a church was going to be coming into view. Because remember, what was, the, what was the purpose of Israel? Israel was to make God known. Israel was to spread the glory of God to the other nations, that they in turn might turn to God. But when they didn't do that, they were moved off the land, and now God birthed the church. Those years later, and now unto Him be glory in the church. That's why we support missionaries. That's why we're sending people out. That's why we got tracts. That's why, that's why we're, the church is to be doing what Israel was supposed to do. We want to know Him, and then we want to make Him known to other people. Amen? Amen. Isn't that what we want to do? Yes, that's what He's called us to do. And so if you look at this, there's a timeline. Look at that. There's Pentecost out of the book of Joel, out of His Spirit, it says... All right, then, then at the end of these things, you're going to see some things. And uh, when he comes back and he actually stands on the Mount of Olives and so forth, there's that millennial valley of a thousand year reign that's going to take place when he's ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. All those things were talked about. As you read through the book of Isaiah, man, you hear about the, what do you hear about? About animal life in the book of, in the book of Isaiah. What does it say about the lamb and the lion. They're going to lay down together. What's the lion going to eat? Grass. Straw. Going to eat straw. Yeah, and grass. He's a carnivore right now, but in the millennium, when the Lord Jesus is on the throne, He won't be eating meat. He'll be eating grass. And that lamb will go up there and wag his little tail, lick his face, and they'll just be buddies. That's what's going to happen. Do you know what it says about the desert? You know what's going to be out here like this? Do you know what West Texas is going to look like? Sister, you drove through it all the time. Sister Abby, you drove through it all the time, didn't you? Do you know what West Texas is going to look like? It's going to bloom like a rose. Man. Why? Because the Lord Jesus will be on the throne. Things will be different right here in that millennium. The devil will be bound for a thousand years. Got a big old chain on him. And he's going to be bound like that and no one will be able to say, well, the devil tempted me and he made me do it. No, when people sin, it would be because they chose to do so. Can't blame it on the devil, you know. Remember that used to be the thing in the 70s, right? Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it, the devil made me do it. You won't be able to say that in the millennium. Is he going to be locked up, all right? So here are some peaks of prophecy. Some things that were there, they just didn't see the church. They just didn't see the church. So let's move on, all right? Now, we're going to get into a little meat here in the time I've got left. The, let's talk about the chronology of things. We talked about the context. Now let's talk about the chronology. When I say chronology, what I'm talking about is the time frame. That's what, if you have a watch, some watches are chronographs. Mine I, look, mine, I just have to look at it, okay? And watch my second hand go around. It's not a chronograph. Chronograph would have like a timer or something on it. So the chronology is going to be the time frame of how these things are going to happen. And this is an illustration of Mr. Larkins uh, on the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. Now he has the whole book outlined here. I'm, I'm really mostly interested in this statue that's right there. And so I want you to find the book of Daniel with me. Please go there, the book of Daniel. And, uh, and we're going to look at some things. The book of Daniel, all right? You have Ezekiel, you have, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. 
You're going to get these. You know, you know, when I was a lost man, I learned the books of the New Testament. Christy made me learn them. I had to drive her 14 miles to daycare. And she was about three, and she goes, all right, Daddy, let's sing. And so we had to sing all the books of the New Testament on the way. And I didn't even own a Bible. I was just lost. I just did it to help entertain her, kept her, kept her out of trouble. And so I didn't tell you what chapter yet. Daniel, let's go to Daniel chapter, let's go to Daniel chapter 1. We'll start at the beginning, all right? Now, Daniel, boy, he's an unusual character. Man, I mean, he got, he got captured when he was a teenager. He, he is turned into a eunuch along with his buddies as teenage young men. And he's made a eunuch, and they keep him around because he's a very bright fellow, smart guy. And, uh, and so, so Daniel here is taken into captivity. Notice what it says. Look in verse 1 of chapter 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Besieged it. So that's what they would do. You know, that's what they're doing in Gaza. They laid siege to it. They cut the water off, cut the food off, cut the medical supplies, cut the power. What were they doing? They were laying siege. That's how they used to do battle a long time ago. You laid siege and nothing came in and nothing went out. But they're telling them to get out, and now Hamas is not letting them get out. They're preventing them from doing it because they know that's their only hope is to have those human shields. You know, that's a cowardly thing to do. Amen. That's something an Amalekite would do. Amalekites attacked the old and the children is what they did. They would sneak around the back rather than face the army of Israel head on. They didn't do it. They went around the back. And God never forgot that. And that's why he told, that's why he told Saul in one of those battles, he said, every one of them that draws breath, kill it. And every one of their beasts, animal, kill it. He didn't forget what the Amalekites did. He didn't forget that. And, uh, and, so, and so here, here, here we find this happening. All right, he besieged it. Notice what it says. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, little G-O-D, you see that? And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God, all right? And so that's where Daniel comes along. And you've heard about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are Chaldean names. Those are not their Jewish names. Those are Chaldean names that they were given. So in Daniel, in Daniel, you're going to find here that as he has outlined this, Daniel's book can be broken up historically and prophetically. Historically and prophetically. And I think it's because of some of these prophecies and things that were in there that those where do, you th where do you think the Magi came from? They said, we have seen his star in the east. That meant they came from the east. They didn't come out of the west. They came out of the east, which would be this area here back where, where the, the area of, of the Chaldeans would have been. And I think they would have understand some things that they learned from Daniel. And they came along and that's how they wound up in Jerusalem. Because Daniel had an impact there in that land. Now that's just extra, all right? That's just my opinion. Okay, and, uh, and so here in, here in Daniel, the book of Daniel, and it correlates to the book of Revelation. If you want to understand some things about Revelation, you're going to have to read the book of Daniel because there are some things that overlap, all right? So, so now notice what happens, okay? And so there is, a, here the, the king, the king has a dream. And, uh, and so... Uh, the king wants to know what's happening, and so but nobody can tell him what's happening and so forth. And, uh, and so he's had this dream, and he gets his guys, and the king's interpreters, they can't interpret the dream. And so they say, well, man, let's ask Daniel. All right? And look in, verse, uh, look in chapter 2, look in verse 19. It says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Uh, and, uh, and Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for, for wisdom and might are His. And He changeth the times and the seasons. Now watch. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with Him. I thank Thee. And praise thee, O God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. 
because their lives are on the line. If you couldn't interpret these things, you're going to be in trouble. And Daniel, God gave him the answer. And Daniel tells him about this. And what's he going to show him? He's going to tell him about this giant statue. This is what, this is what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. And he said, I dreamed about this. And there's a statue there. I dreamed about this man. And man, his head was gold. And his body here, this was silver, his arms and chest, his, uh, his, around his waist and his thighs. This was made of brass. His legs were made of iron. And his feet were a mixture of clay and iron. And then there was a big stone that came along and knocked the statue over. And he wanted to know what that was. And so the Lord gives Daniel, the Lord gives Daniel, the answer, if you will, to the riddle, to the vision. And that head right there, it, this represents, that represented Nebuchadnezzar, the king. It was made of gold, and it's also represented by animals. It was a lion with wings. You know, the lion is what? It's the king of the jungle, right? He, he's the beast with the mostest, okay? And, uh, and according to the book of Proverbs, you know, no one stands in his way, man. They, I mean, I've watched them online. So, man, they'll attack an elephant. They'll attack a, 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 a cape buffalo. They're not afraid, man. They'll just get on them, chew on them and everything. Do all that. Some of them get beat up. They do, but they're not afraid. And so that was, that was Nebuchadnezzar, and he was the head of that. And then the next one in line is going to be the Medes and Persians. They hadn't even come on the scene yet. Nobody knew what a Mede was and nobody knew what a Persian was. But Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and Daniel tells him what the dream means. And he says, there's another empire coming. When yours is over, Nebuchadnezzar, there's another empire coming and it's going to be the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians, if you want to know about that time frame, that's the book of Esther. The Medes and the Persians, King Ahasuerus. He's also known by another name, Artaxerxes. Maybe you've heard the name Xerxes before. And, uh, and the Medes and Persians, and he is represented by a bear. And he is silver. And he's got two arms, the arms of the Medes and the arms of the Persians, all right? And how is a bear, when they're marauding, man, they're slow, they're strong, you know? When they're running, they can run about 40 miles an hour, but they are so strong. And the Medes and Persians, man, they whooped up on everybody. It was the Persian Empire that did in the Spartans in Thermopylae. Do you remember that? The 300 Spartans? There's a story about that. They, when they came against Greece, no one would stand with them, but they stood against them and defeated and held off the army of Artaxerxes for a long time till they were betrayed. They showed them a back way in and they were defeated. All right? But the Medes and Persians are going to come along. And there are dates with these things when this happened. And, uh, and so as we're moving, again, we're moving forward in time towards zero. And these are the Gentile powers that are going to be in power that the Lord Jesus said, until the fullness, uh, uh, correction, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Because Israel is not a world dominance during this time. They're, they're, in, they're in captivity. It's going to be Cyrus here and, and Darius who's going to come along and tell, and tell Nehemiah, okay, you can go back to Jerusalem and you can rebuild the walls and you can fix the gates that have been burnt with fire. So as you're learning some of these things about this, it helps put those books of the Old Testament, it kind of puts them in order of things. So you see their relevance. You know, when you finish the book of 2 Kings in your Old Testament, do you know who the, do you know who the prophet is at that time? It's Malachi. All right? It, in that time frame, I believe it's Malachi, because I know they're, they're going to go in, they're going to go into captivity and so forth. And really when you get to the end of 2 Kings, you're really at the end of the Old Testament because they're getting gone. Zedekiah is going to stay there, and Jeremiah is going to stay in the land, Ezekiel's going to take them off into, off into Babylon and so forth, where they're going to be with Nebuchadnezzar. And that's where they're going to be, all right? And so, so both northern and southern Israeli kingdoms go into exile. The northern kingdom went in 722, the Israeli, the southern kingdom, that's Benjamin and Judah. It goes into captivity in 587 B.C. And so that's where, that's where Isaiah is preaching to them, don't be like your sister, Judah, don't be like your sister. He's warning them, don't do what they did, don't do what they did. 
But they didn't listen. They did what their sister did. And they went into captivity. And they lost the land. And so now each Gentile power is depicted by the statue by a metal, whether it be gold, silver, brass, or iron, and also by an animal. Look in Daniel chapter 7 with me. Daniel 7. And look in verse 1. Now Nebuchadnezzar is dead. Belshazzar has come along. He's now king after Nebuchadnezzar. Still, still in Babylon. All right. Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. When you read the word sea in there, now he's actually thinking about an ocean, a sea or whatever. But the bottom line is a lot of times that's a reference to a large amount of people. So out of all these peoples that are in the world, out are going to come these beasts. All right. And so each one is represented. So the first one there in chapter 7, notice what it says in verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. That's Nebuchadnezzar. That's Nebuchadnezzar. And he was a great conqueror. Look at verse 5. And behold another beast, a second like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it and they said thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. And that's what the Persians were. The Persians were the ones that were defeating all the armies and conquering all that land. Persia is where you have Damascus and where you have um, uh, uh, Iraq and Iran and, and parts of that area. That whole region there is that whole Arabian Nights. And that's all Persia, all right? And, uh, and then look, and look in verse 6. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. That is represented by this empire right here. The Macedonians, those are the Greeks. Those are the Greeks. And so who was the, who was the Greek that conquered the world that then was? That was Alexander. And the four little heads that are there represent the four generals that Alexander had. One of them was, um, one of them was Ptolemy, spelled with a P, P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, Ptolemy. He settles Egypt and North Africa. A lot of people would go to Ptolemy down the road. Uh, Egypt, in particular like Alexandria, Egypt, had the greatest library in all the world, collected all those things, and that's where Ptolemy went. Others went to the region where, where uh, Judea is, and there was, uh, there was um, I put their names down here, there was, there was Ptolemy, Cassander, uh, Seleucus, and uh, Antigonus. And they divided up the land. When, when, uh, when Alexander died, he was 33 years old. And those generals, they divided up the land and they said, okay, I'm going to run this one, I'm going to run that part, you run that part, and you run that part. And that's what they did until Rome comes along. And that's where these two legs are, the legs of iron. Listen to what it says. Look in verse 7. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Those ten horns represent that, uh, that Roman Empire, if you will, the common market of those days. And the Empire of Rome went all the way into Great Britain and went all the way over and conquered all those things where you know where you had all the the Middle Eastern places hey this is where you have Cleopatra she gets involved when you've got um, 
you have uh, Julius Caesar, and then you're going to have Mark Antony and so forth. Those were all Roman Caesars. Those were all, and hence you get to Titus of Rome. He's going to be in that group that we had read about already, Titus of Rome. Why? Because Rome is going to be in power here. The, the right leg represents the Western Orthodox Church. That's the papal powers. The left leg represents the Greek Orthodox Church. There was a time when there were three popes. Did you know that? There was one in Constant Constantinople, Istanbul, but it got its name from Constantine. He broke with Rome and uh, he became himself a pope. And, uh, and then there was the one that was in Rome, and so you have a second pope. And then you had a third one in France up in Avignon. And, uh, and so they were all competing for who is the vicar of the church on earth. And the bottom line is, none of them were. Amen. Amen. That's right. None of them were. But there were three popes at one time. And you know what one pope would do to the other pope? He would just excommunicate you. Even though you were dead, he would just sort of cut you off. He had the power to do that. There's a lot of, th there is so much deception. And so many people died at the hands of these people right here at the church in Rome. And so that's why that they are so different. That's why he said this one came out and man, it was worse than anything, than any of the other ones put together. It was worse. Now the feet of this, at the feet of this is going to be a mixture of, uh, of, of clay, the smaller kingdoms, feet and toes of iron and clay. Did you ever try to hold something together with iron and clay? It's very brittle. It's very brittle and subject to easy breakage. And so look right here. Here is the kingdom of God. And there is a stone that's going to come and it's going to hit the feet of that statue and over it's going to go. And that is going to mark the end of the Gentile powers. And that stone that comes back, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a time frame for all those things. So I, I don't want you to lose heart, church, by the fact of what you see. And, uh, and, and so we're just going to have to wait on this, all right? Daniel's 70th week of prophecy. How many of you know something about Daniel's 70th week? All right. We're going to look into that, Daniel's 70th week. It's going to be very interesting for you. But the thing, you say, well, what are we going to take away from this? What I want you to take away from, he's on the throne, beloved. <laughs> Remember what we said in our Sunday school class, that our Bible is accurate historically as well as prophetically. And here are just some more details about what's going to happen and what has been foretold is going to happen and it's coming to pass even as we are drawing breath tonight. And so, you know, as you watch these things, some things that you ought to keep in mind. Boy, always keep your eye on Israel, what they do and how they do. Keep your eye also on the temple of David. The temple of David. How many of y'all know what the Dome of the Rock is? The Dome of the Rock. That is where, I, I, any, anybody here been to the Holy Land? Oh man, good on you, brother, you've been. Uh, and you went too? Oh, man, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, and, uh, and so, but the Dome of the Rock, that is where Abraham is buried. And, and you have, you have like, almost like three groups, religious groups that all want to claim it. Christian, Jew, and Muslim. Because you got to remember, Ishmael... Ishmael's daddy was Abraham. That's what happens when you introduce an Egyptian solution into a spiritual problem. Amen. And, and, that's what, and that's what you have fighting right now over there. You have Ishmael fighting against Isaac. And, uh, and so, uh, but in that Dome of the Rock, that is where, the, where David's temple is to be built. And there's other things like the ashes of a red heifer and all that. They found the formula for that. That is how they would That is how they would dedicate all the instruments and so forth. They had to have the ashes of a red heifer, which was done a certain way, and then they could do that. Jeremiah wrote about that, hid those things away, and they were found. Archaeologists found that. And so um, there's a lot of things that are going on, and there's a lot of people that have a curiosity about these things. But here's the thing that you've got to take away. Nothing surprises our Heavenly Father. 
and you and I, we can rest easy about those things. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, they, 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 they raised a little height in something about that we ought to be paying attention because of these things, because of this jihad that they're calling for. You know, if you see something, you need to say something. And have your head on a swivel. Pay attention. You say, well, we live in Kerrville, Brother Ed. What does that got to do with anything? You know, and, uh, and so all the more reason, all the more reason to be paying attention and to be vigilant. But know this, that ultimately, there, all these things are happening under the sun, but I thank God there's a God over the sun and knows these things, and you don't have to be fretting about it, worrying about it. What's going to happen is the world, you know, people know, well, what are we going to tell our children? And I, you see them all the time get worked up. What are we going to do for these children? We've got to help. Give them the truth. Give them the truth. That'll help them. Knowledge of the truth brings freedom. That's what Jesus said. If you know the truth, the truth will what? Set you free. And, uh, and so that you don't have to be fretting and you don't have to be worried about it. Because all these things, when I think about the world and the Lord, I just think about a giant chess board. Yeah, anybody in here play chess besides me? And so, what, and so what, you know, a chess board, boy, it's one move, counter move, is it not? And you've got to keep the whole board in view. And that's exactly what the Lord's doing. So these countries and nations and peoples and leaders are just all like pawns and pieces on a chessboard that He moves them when it suits Him. But He's already got the game won. Amen? Because He's so many steps ahead of everybody else. <laughs> and the devil hadn't got it figured out. He hadn't had it figured out in a long time. I'm just saying, I don't want you, as you see these things, I don't want you to say, oh, you know, oh, Pastor, what's going on? I want you to know what's going on, but you don't have to fret about it. You don't have to fret about it. It's here in our Bible. So let me challenge you. Go through the book of Daniel. Read the book of Daniel. It's not that many chapters. Read the book of Daniel. It's interesting. You'll see him come through the lion's den and the Hebrew boys that don't even smell like smoke. Amen. Yeah. You read about them and all those things. But it'll be a blessing to you. But we'll talk about, Lord willing, We'll talk about Daniel's 70th week of prophecy. This hasn't happened yet. It's a future event, but it's the, just about the next event on God's timeline. All right? Any questions? Good. All right. Then we'll go. <laughs> Write them down. Save them for next week, okay? All right, let's pray. Father, I sure do thank you for the Bible. And Lord, I don't claim to know all the answers to all the things. But Lord, I do thank you for what you have made plain for us to understand. And Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit and His light and illumination that we can enjoy and the peace of God. Lord, you put these things in here. You said the things that were written aforetime were for our learning and that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures we might have hope. Lord, thank you for letting us in on that. Just like how you let Abraham in because he was your friend. And that's what you said of the disciples. He said, I call you friends for you reveal things to your friends. Thank you, Lord, for how you love us, how you provided for us, how you protect us. We love you and we thank you tonight. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's a lot to absorb. I know that. But, but that's why we have time. Yes, ma'am. I was going to ask, um, would there be a way next time to have a printout? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's